Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jen Nolan and I'm one of the program managers at Arthritis Victoria. As I'm sure you're aware, Arthritis Victoria is a not-for-profit community-based organisation which works to achieve the best possible musculoskeletal health and wellbeing for all Victorians. To mark National Pain Week, Arthritis Victoria is very pleased to present to you this webinar titled Confronting Chronic Pain, Self-Management is Easy to Say, But What Works? Arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions are the most common chronic conditions in Australia, affecting almost one third of the population. Arthritis Victoria is very interested in the area of pain management and self-management, given that arthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions are major contributors to pain and disability. I would now likely like to warmly welcome and thank Professor Michael Nicholas, who will be our presenter for today. Michael is a clinical psychologist and director of the ADAPT, Pain Management Program and the Pain Education Program at the Pain Management Research Institute at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney. He also holds a conjoint appointment as Professor in the Faculty of Medicine, Medicine at the University of Sydney and Michael's current research interests include the self-management of persisting pain in older Australians, ways of reducing the threat value of persisting pain, self management strategies in adjustment to persisting pain and early psychosocial interventions to prevent long-term disability in people with compensable injuries. Can I also remind you that if you have any te technical difficulties, please refer to the message box on your screen. Um, there's some information there uh, where the red back, red back conferencing people can assist you. You can also type questions for Michael at any time. However, he will answer questions at the end of his presentation. Any questions that remain unanswered, will be, um, will, uh, we will attempt to deal with offline. Before Michael, asking Michael to commence, however, could I please put in the inevitable request asking our webinar participants today to complete the exit survey. This information will greatly assist us in, in evaluating our webinar and planning future activities. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Michael. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, I hope it's coming through uh, clearly. Um, um, and this is a very exciting uh, occasion because it's, it's my first attempt at one of these. So uh, the uh, Redback team have been guiding me uh, very uh, well. But uh, it, please forgive any technical hitches that might be due to me. Um, so. Um, uh, this is uh, obviously a, a, a big topic, uh, and I'm going to try to uh, cover a, 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 a part of it. Um, but I'm sure you'll have additional questions, uh, particularly about things that I don't get to. But so do feel free to ask me things, uh, type them in, and try to address them. Uh, okay. Um, so we know that um, uh, pain is. Uh, this week we all experience pain. Um, pain is actually a good thing. It tells us there's something wrong. It's a warning signal. But that, it is useful, uh, although people in pain, of course, uh, it went away. Um, uh, when it doesn't go away, it causes suffering and ultimately disability, interference in the enjoyment of life, um, and so on. And uh, that often brings people to visit healthcare providers. Um, so, and so while we have pain around injury and uh, surgical um, uh, problems at the community level, are uh, more to do with chronic pain. Just, uh, and unfortunately, once it uh, becomes chronic, which can be between three to six months if, if it hasn't gone away, then uh, there may be no real they say will um, or whether or when it will go away. Um, but in this uh, situation, find ways of managing. Yes, it's quite similar to um, other chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, cures either. But uh, once they're given a uh, one of the problems in pain has been that it, uh, we've far too long just relied upon uh, 
doctors or surgeons doing something to us or giving us pills uh, to fix the problem. Um, and that is fine when the pain is acute, so it becomes chronic. Um, those, those approaches uh, are not as effective. They certainly don't usually cure the problem. Uh, and then, in fact, of course, they can cause additional problems of um, you know, side effects of drugs and so on are, are very well known. So you've often got to weigh up. And it's, uh, that is, I guess, the focus of today's session. How, how do you manage uh, persisting or chronic pain? It's uh, accepted with uh, asthma and diabetes, and no, no one ever really questions that. But when it comes to pain, uh, our community tends to believe that someone else fix it for us. And, of course, as we don't have all the answers, um, we're likely to let people down. Um, and I guess what we've been working at over many years now, uh, at least a number of us, is to find ways of helping people. But nevertheless, it does remain a challenge, and I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. And I don't think anyone else does either. Um, however, we're, we're working on it. So, uh, I also have a couple of references who are interested in reading more on the topic that I've published. That on the sort of methods that we're talking about. This one was published in the uh, Best Practice and Research uh, Clinical Rheumatology in 2008. Um, and uh, the second was employing psychological approaches to enhance physiotherapists uh, that we published last year, uh, where I published with an American physiotherapist in their journal. And... Um, the important point here really is that um, self-management really involves a lot of issues, but it, interventions don't, I believe, have to be done just by psychologists, um, because firstly there aren't enough of them, and secondly, um, a lot of them don't know much about pain, and uh, people in pain tend to see more uh, GPs or uh, physios than they'll see psychologists. So I think it's important that physios and GPs are better equipped to assist with self-management. And this, this paper was an attempt to find the sorts of things that do the same applies, obviously, to GPs. Now, how common... Um, people always say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have... When you actually ask the uh, community... This conference is now... This in presentation is mode. New South Wales, conducted by the New South Wales Health Department across the state. And I interviewed at random 17,000 people uh, who uh, took part in the statewide health survey in the late 90s. And this was published by Fiona Blythe and her colleagues in the journal Pain in 2001. And you can see there that actually quite a lot of people have persisting pain. The percentages are along the bottom of the, of the graph. And you can see that the percentage rises uh, with age. Uh, but the, the, the very two bottom bars are the, the male and female averages. So 17% of, of males, that's aged over 16, and uh, females in the same age group, uh, is about 20% of, uh, of adult women, have some form of persisting pain. So it's close to one in five of our community. Uh, and it's always important to bear that in mind, that... Uh, a lot of people have persisting pain, and more, more than uh, we might realise. So it's not an unusual problem. So we say about one in five have some form of ongoing pain. Of course, the causes are multiple. Uh, obviously, arthritis and uh, uh, similar conditions is, is a key one. Others are caused by injuries, um, and, and so on, and other, other conditions. But um, when people have persisting pain, they, they are often find it's interfering in many as aspects of their lives. Uh, in this uh, New South Wales survey, about 60% of those who said they had chronic pain said it was interfering in their, um, in their activities of daily life. So the, the good thing about that, if you like, is that it means that not everybody with persisting pain is disabled. So it's possible to have chronic pain and not be disabled. Now, many of these people would have obviously worked it out for themselves, but some others will, will need help. And I guess that's the 
the focus of clinicians uh, of different disciplines, is to work out how to help those people. Now, um, the, uh, the problem, of course, is um, as we get older, we usually have a number of conditions, um, not just pain or arthritis or, or something else. They, um, and the more of these other conditions, the comorbid uh, problems, um, they're often called, uh, the, the, the greater the load we have to, to carry. And a study that uh, uh, my group here and uh, colleagues in New Zealand have just completed is a survey in New Zealand, a very similar survey to the one done in New South Wales, of the New Zealand population. And what we did there was looked at the effect of um, comorbidities on pain and vice versa. And what we found, indeed, was that the more conditions you have, the, the greater the burden. But uh, it was particularly bad when you, got, if you were depressed. And depression seemed to make a lot of things a lot worse, and including pain. So uh, the quality of life for people who are, uh, have got chronic pain and depression is a lot worse than people who have just got either. Um, so it, it points to the need for us to take a fairly um, broad or holistic view of people with chronic conditions and not just see us ourselves as trying to help them with one of those. They may need help in, um, for, for, for many of the problems they're presenting with. Now, if we turn back to pain, um, what, what are people's ideas about how pain works in, in our bodies? Uh, for most of us, uh, we have what is called a traditional biomedical approach, and, and this is the view probably held by most of our community, that um, if you get an injury or some disease, you get some um, you know, in, uh, tissue damage uh, or, or, or nociception or nerve damage, which is neuropathy, uh, and this triggers the experience of pain. And that, in turn, then affects your, your, your mood. And um, that, that seems fairly straightforward. And then, of course, the, uh, the treatment implications are, well, you just either get rid of the cause or you block the pathway. So if you go to the dentist to have a, have a tooth filled or taken out, they give you a local anesthetic. It, it blocks the pathway. You don't feel pain uh, at the time. Um, or if you get a headache, you take a Panadol and the pain goes away, and you're fine. And, that's, I guess, the, the basic view most people would tend to have of uh, uh, pain and injury and, and, uh, and what to do ab about it. And, and that is fine. And that, of course, uh, works with a lot of problems. And we've all had that experience, so with, for example, with the headaches and taking some paracetamol. Um, and so with chronic pain, however, the picture is different. Uh, as I said, we don't really have cures for chronic pain. Um, there are some ex exceptions uh, where pain can go away, and uh, w uh, perhaps the most well-known are hip replacements, um, where uh, they, they can often result in people being pain-free, but certainly not in all cases. Uh, there are a lot of people who have hip replacements who still continue to experience their pain. That Functionally, they may be better, but uh, many still have pain. But certainly, once you develop pain, what do our treatments achieve? Well, um, most surveys, and this was one done in 2002, and I don't think it's really improved much on that, uh, most um, uh, current treatments might achieve about a 30% reduction in pain. That's a long way from cure. Um, and this is at best. This is published studies. So this is not just studies uh, that uh, uh, found nothing. This is the, the published studies tend to be the, uh, the, get the, 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 the clearest results. So the, the reality is, Many treatments are a lot worse than achieving a 30% reduction. And that is a lot, um, not nearly what a lot of people want. Most patients coming to um, for help with pain want it either completely gone or at least a reduction of 50%. Um, so we, we are going to let down a lot of people if we just um, use uh, those sort of uh, medication or, or injections and so on. They won't be sufficient. So we, we, the reality is we cannot cure most people with chronic pain. And continuing to try to cure can actually lead to more problems, like uh, what are called sort of iatrogenic effects, um, which are the results of, of, um, of treatment. And this, of course, is the last thing anyone treating someone wants, is actually to make them worse. But um, we have a term called doctor shopping, where people go from one doctor to the next. And, of course, the more doctors you see, the more likely you are to find someone who will do something. Um, but when it's chronic pain, uh, uh, that could well lead to misadventure and in fact uh, cause more problems. So uh, there's, a, there's an issue here about when do you stop seeking cures? 
And when do you take stock and say, well, what are my, my options? What else could I be doing? Um, and you can see the concerns about this um, uh, are many. Um, uh, the, the sort of the sexy ones are to do with drugs, I guess. And this was, uh, you can see in this article from the Sydney Morning Herald um, a couple of years ago, um, there was concern about the rise, and the, there's a continuing concern about this, the rise in the use of strong analgesics, pretty the opioids, for uh, chronic pain. And the, um, the Royal College's physicians put out a physician paper on this, um, and this is what prompted this, this uh, article in the Herald. But, you, but the, the issue there was, I think, a concern about addiction. Um, but I, I thought, actually, they made a bit of a mistake here, that, that really... Um, they should have been thinking about why do people get on these drugs, uh, not just try to deal with addiction, because that's really down the track and the horse is bolted there. What if they looked at, well, why do people get prescribed these things? What are they taking them for? And in many cases, of course, they're legally prescribed and they're taking them for pain. Um, the trouble is that the drugs don't cure and therefore people keep taking more um, and they up the dose and so on. And um, that then leads to the, the sort of problems we typically see. So it doesn't really... It's not really a typical drug addiction problem. It's a, a more of a, more a dependence issue in the light of people who haven't got anything else, any other way of managing, or that or the prescribers may not have other ways of helping people. So, um, but it's unfortunate that the focus tends to be on addiction. As I said, I think that's a, a media response. But it's not just, of course, in this country that the problem exists uh, and elsewhere. In fact, if anything, it's worse in the United States. Um, this was a, an editorial um, paper on um, this concern of over-treating back pain, one of the most common chronic pain problems. Uh, and Rick Dayo, the uh, first author of this, is a leading proponent of you know, moderation in the way back problems get treated. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, he doesn't get hurt because if you can see from the data that they, they have summarized, that since the 1990s, there's been a huge increase in uh, epidural uh, steroids uh, for back pain, huge increase in opioids for back pain. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, you know, a huge increase in the number of MRI investigations um, and uh, often seem to be more shopping trips rather than and actually trying to confirm what the surgeon might think. Um, and then, of course, there's a huge rise in surgery. And um, these, these figures are very, very similar within Australia. Um, but you can see that despite all that, they were finding no evidence that outcomes were improving. So although um, uh, people were getting a lot more treatments, they weren't making people any healthier or any more functional. Um, and in Australia, you'll see at the bottom, the, um, the Royal College's physicians uh, uh, use Medicare um, data to identify that oxycodone is, has quadrupled from 2000, in, uh, or since 2000, uh, to 1.6 uh, million in um, 2007. So, uh, yet, I guess we're not aware that pain has ceased being a problem uh, with this massive increase in prescribing. Um, so that, the, the actual way we treat it, I think, is part of the problem. And this is why we have to step back and think, is there a, might there be a better way? Um, it should also be remembered that although we, we talk about opioids as strong painkillers, they actually don't have very good evidence for their effectiveness in chronic pain conditions. Uh, in fact, in a, a systematic review of their use for chronic uh, back pain, found the longest study had gone for 16 weeks. Now, uh, if, it, if we're talking chronic, we're meaning years. We're not talking about weeks. Um, and yet the evidence is only in, in the, in, at the level of, uh, of weeks. So uh, the, the prescription for these drugs as the, as the solution for back pain and other chronic pains is based on very limited evidence. So they're not necessarily effective, even though we might call them strong, they don't actually work very well, uh, and they certainly don't fix all the problems that people present with, uh, with chronic pain conditions. So they aren't always the answer. They can be, obviously, in some people, but on, uh, on mass, they're, they're certainly uh, not. And this is recognized uh, just about everywhere. In the, in the UK, the British Medical Journal acknowledged back in 2005 that, that, that they had a problem, the same sort of problem we, we had. Um, so, what we've got then is a, is a, cr a common problem, chronic pain, um, regardless of how it's caused. Once it's become chronic, the cause actually doesn't matter very much any longer. It's what are you going to do about it, given we don't have a cure. 
Um, the treatments uh, that seem to work for acute pain, uh, when you first get some pain, they, they don't seem to work very well with chronic pain. In fact, one of the problems is people keep trying to treat chronic pain as if it were acute pain, and that, that's a fundamental error. Um, and in fact, it can even make things worse. So what are our options here? So what about if we step back and try to make sense of this problem of, of chronic pain, rather than just keep on bashing away this thing we, we call pain? Now, I'm sorry if this looks a rather busy diagram. Uh, because of the technology, I've got to, I normally put this up in stages, but because of the technology, I've had to put it up um, in one go. But I'll just talk you through this, this uh, diagram, starting over on the, uh, the left-hand side. Um, if, you, if you look down where I've got this little marker thing, uh, when, um, when you've got um, injury uh, or tissue damage, you've, it fires off neurons, um, uh, that register in the brain, and that's, that causes uh, the, the experience of pain in the first instance. If changes over time, if changes start to take place up here in the central nervous system, we call this uh, 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 mechanisms like central sensitization, then, uh, you can, then we think that underpins the transition from uh, acute pain to chronic pain. So acute pain starts out as what we call um, nociceptive pain, uh, but it then becomes a more of a, either a neuro neuroplastic pain, which is to do with changes in the nervous system, or in fact neuropathic, where you actually talk, we talk about injury to the nervous system. But this, uh, this happens uh, down the track. Um, uh, we believe in, in most chronic pain conditions, these changes go are going on, not just peripherally where people feel the pain, but also more centrally. Um, and that makes it extremely difficult to reverse. Um, and what this does is mean you've got a number of possible causes for chronic pain. So it's not just caused by your condition. There are uh, pain, uh, once it becomes chronic, in fact, is now being talked about as, as, a, as a disease entity in its own right. It takes on uh, a character um, and has features um, that go beyond the original cause of pain. Uh, and it becomes uh, often self-maintaining. Um, but... Besides that, what you then got to think about is what happens over time. And of course what happens is that people stop doing things, so their activities are reduced. And of course everybody knows when you stop doing activities, then you'll get physical deterioration, so changes in your, um, um, uh, in your body, you get muscle wasting, put on weight, your joint stiffness, and so on. And when that happens, of course you don't feel like doing things, so you do less, and you'll find uh, activity to reduce. So that's why the arrows go both ways, um, because one thing leads to another, and of course you get a feedback loop occurring. And the same thing happens with mood. If you stop doing things that are important to you, then what, what happens is that uh, down here you'll start, you'll find this uh, arrow, down, it's like a snakes and ladder sort of diagram, uh, you start getting uh, depressed. Uh, and, of course, when you feel depressed, you don't feel like doing things, so you do less. And so the, the problem uh, goes back that in the other direction as well. And that, that sort of feeds on each other. And I mentioned earlier that when people are depressed and in pain, they're suffering, their quality of life is much worse than when they've just got either. But often depression isn't pure. People have a sense of helplessness, frustration, often anger, uh, sleep disturbance. They all become part of the problem, which then compounds the problem of pain. Uh, they can also have developed unhelpful uh, beliefs, thinking, for example, you know, I've just got to find the right doctor and going on a search for this uh, magical person who's going to fix them. And all that time, they're staying in this, what we call an acute model, looking for the, for the cure. Um, and that uh, moves you away from what you can do for yourself. So, and then that, in turn, will compound your sense of helplessness. Uh, repeated treatment failures is clearly another key feature of people with chronic pain. It's because the treatments don't work and you try a lot of things, uh, that is your experience. And each time a treatment fails, that uh, lowers your mood. Uh, over time, of course, you can also get into lots of drugs and then they create a problem because of their side effect profiles. It can be in your stomach, it can be mentally, uh, could, could also be in your gut with constipation. So the strong opioids, or the opioids generally, will uh, cause more constipation, and then you've got to take something for that, and, and so on. 
Uh, and of course, uh, at home, if you lose your uh, work, you lose your job, you can't do everything you normally do or want to do or your responsibilities at home, that can lead to family stress compounding the problem. But you've also got down at the bottom here, you've got uh, input from the people around you, your environment, your family, healthcare providers, the community, your employer if you're a worker. Um, they, they, they're not just sitting there inert. They may well be um, uh, influencing all these things. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes the influence may not be very helpful. It, it may be, may be well-meaning, but it may actually lead people astray. So, uh, and you'll also, particularly when the advice is conflicting. So some people will say, you know, exercise. Other people say, don't exercise. Other people say, take drugs, and others say, don't. And, and this gets very confusing, of course, for the person in pain. It's not only dealing with their pain and the impact on their life, but also they're getting this confusing message from the people around them. And this, this, this is, I think, a key element and why it's very important that everyone trying to treat chronic pain is on the same page. Uh, um, but getting agreement is another matter. But the, the net result of all these things is what I call excessive suffering, excessive disability. Uh, these things interact and they summate. Uh, and we know it's excessive because there are people with exactly the same um, cause of pain who don't look like this, who do function, who do get on with their lives, who are not disabled. They're not suffering. But the people we see clinically, of course, tend to look more like this. And this was a diagram I actually developed from just talking to patients in the early 80s when I started working in a pain clinic at Westmead Hospital in Sydney. Um, I didn't, knew nothing about pain, so I had to find out. And I, one of the, apart from reading the literature and, uh, uh, and uh, talking in the, to the other people in our clinic, uh, the, the key source of my knowledge about pain came from the, the patients and asking them, and that, this is how I developed this uh, diagram. Really, it came from the patient's experience, their lived experience, and the impact that it had on them. And I must say that since I developed this diagram, I use this with every patient I see, um, try to get them to see all the issues that they're facing, because they come in saying, I've just got pain. Well, after a short time of talking, you'll find you don't just have pain, you've got a lot of problems. And when you put it like this, I've never found a patient to disagree with the, the ideas behind this diagram. And that's an important step in moving on with pain. So that getting that, what, what we call the conceptual or reconceptualization of the problem. So uh, we're dealing with more than a pain problem. We've got, sure, there's persisting pain, but also because of sensitization effects in the central nervous system, uh, you've got often pain that's been triggered by activities that are ostensibly normal and shouldn't be painful. Um, and this is perplexing, but this is the effect of that central sensitization process where you, your, your nervous system basically is just more sensitized. Um, you've got disability, you've got unhelpful beliefs, there's mood disturbance, uh, side effects from medication, multiple losses. Losses are often a major issue for people with chronic pain. It's things they can't do, have had to give up, and so on. And of course, changes at, at home, at work, and so on, can't play golf with their friends or tennis. So it really can interfere with many aspects of normal life. So um, when, when we're dealing with chronic pain, we're not in a position of just saying, let me fix your pain. Because firstly, we can't do that in most cases. But secondly, that's not the only problem that, that we've got here. And it's just getting this idea is critical for what do we do. So, and is it, you have to think, is it likely if you just tack, tackle one or two, that'll be enough? So if you just tackle the pain, but what will be, happen? Well, we know that the best we can achieve is about a 30% reduction for most people. Is that going to be enough? Well, most of our patients say no. Um, what about exercise? Just getting fit, that's great, and that'll help your fitness and help with your weight, and that's good, but will it be enough for all the problems? It's unlikely. So there's unlikely to be a single thing you can do that will fix everything. That means you need to think about a number of things you do, or more likely, that the patient has to do. So, um, so rather than just focusing all our intervention on the pain, uh, which is the sort of the, 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 sort of the standard that, that we see, so this becomes the, the, the big focus, what if we uh, tackled all of these problems in some uh, hopefully organized manner, but what, what if we did this? So if we start off over on, on the, uh, the left-hand side, sure, we could look at medication, we could look at relaxation, distraction techniques, desensitizing, 
to their pain. So the things we can do that will can modulate the pain a bit, um, and that no doubt will be uh, appreciated by the patient. Um, but there are also other things they can do. But what about activities? We've got to address those. And we, we, we believe if you, you've got to, you can't wait for pain to settle uh, in a chronic condition. It's got to, got to be tackled while they're in pain. But the, uh, they can't go straight back to what they would like to do or used to do. Instead, they've got to work out their goals and work towards them in a gradual way. And I often tell people, this is just what athletes do. When they're training for the Olympics, they don't start out at Olympic speed. They start out with what they can do at the time, and then they gradually work up according to a plan. So working to a, an activity or an exercise plan with a physio, uh, with an exercise person at the gym, wherever, or at home, um, they need to work with uh, clear goals, working towards um, uh, things that they want to achieve, but in a planned, step-by-step or paced way. Um, they may also need to look at their diet and so on, of course, because overweight it complicates the problems. Education is going to be very important. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Laura Mamovi and uh, David Butler wrote a nice book about trying to explain pain to people. And lo lots of ideas in there, I think, are very useful for that process um, of helping people to demystify pain, to understand it a bit more and realise that the pain itself, isn't, once it becomes chronic, is not harming them. It may feel like it, but it's actually um, uh, more to do with activity in the nervous system that's really got out of hand, and uh, they need to look at what they can do to deal with this. So it is um, under getting a, a clearer idea about pain and, and a realistic idea um, and challenging any unhelpful beliefs. A, it's an important element to managing pain. With regard to the, to the drugs, it's, um, more is not necessarily better. In fact, often less is better because you'll get rid of the side effects. So what a, a lot of what we do is take people off their painkillers. Um, because firstly, they don't, they're misnamed, they don't kill pain, <laughs> they, they, but they can and kill your enjoyment of life. So what we'll uh, what do is what we say, rationalise, um, reduce the, the, the range of drugs, um, and then gradually reduce uh, till we find either they're off them altogether uh, or that they find that they can um, manage with much less, providing they're doing the other things as well. So it's not just relying on drugs. I think that's a critical thing. That, that uh, aspect is... Um, uh, critical to, to address. Uh, in terms of the home environment or, or the work environment, then some negotiations with the, the, the workplace um, and other healthcare providers um, to get on the same page so you're all working on an agreed plan. Um, that, that is a critical aspect of uh, managing long-term pain. The, main, the person may need to learn some new skills for, say, working despite pain, uh, they may need to modify their work. They may need to modify things at home. Um, uh, that needs to be obviously negotiated um, according to what's available, what's feasible, and so on. But it means looking beyond, again, beyond pain, to looking at function. That, that's critical here. Um, and, of course, we don't just live uh, to work. We also want to get something uh, more out of life. And so it's important that people start to uh, look at activities that they stopped doing that they'd like to get back to that, that gave their lives you know, meaning, it gave them a uh, source of enjoyment and fun. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that I think is very important, whether it's going fishing or going to the movies or going to the beach, um, um, whatever it is, collecting stamps. Uh, it is just, uh, it's, it's critical that people start looking at um, not just getting out of pain, but actually trying to do things that they would normally enjoy and uh, getting back into those as much as possible. Of course, uh, if you've got sleep problems, they need to be addressed. Often it's the way they go about it. It's not about taking more sleeping tablets. It's about developing good sleep habits. Um, and that, and there, there's a lot written about that. But we certainly know if people have good sleep, they have less pain. Um, and uh, it's not just achieved by, by taking sleeping tablets. In fact, they may be uh, unhelpful because they may increase tiredness through the day. Uh, so it is important that people learn good sleep habits because they, they will actually have less pain, and if they have less pain, of course, they, they'll probably sleep better. So there's an interaction there that you can work on. Um, if they're getting angry and frustrated with the world, um, that isn't going to help pain, uh, and that, therefore, got to be addressed as well. Not waiting for pain to go away, but actually learning about how are they dealing with the other stresses and um, problems in their lives. So other communication skills or anger management can often be useful. And because it's chronic, 
uh, then, of course, we need a maintenance plan. Um, just like you do with asthma or diabetes, uh, the condition will, uh, the pain will fluctuate over time, um, and uh, you'll have flare-ups at times. You need to have a plan to deal with these, and that, I guess, is, is critical. Um, that it's not just say um, one treatment is going to fit everybody. It's got to be planned for that person or with that person to develop a, a long-term approach. Not just expecting a, a couple of sessions or a week or something like that to be enough. Um, and all, it's a long-term problem, just like asthma or diabetes, and you need a, a long-term plan. So that would basically be the sort of range of things that, that, uh, that I believe people can do. And it's not rocket science, uh, but it is not e it's not all that easy. Um, but it's more than just thinking up the next drug or next procedure that, that uh, might be helpful. Um, but of course, one of the problems we have is that uh, it's hard to get people to accept this idea. I mean, this is a, a sort of off to the side, but it's, I've done some work with insurance companies dealing with workers' comp uh, pe comp uh, um, uh, claimants, people injured at work. Um, and I've asked insurance staff about pain, and this came from a, back, a measure called the Back Pain Beliefs Questionnaire. And uh, the question in this case was, uh, a reduction in pain is necessary before a person can start resuming normal functioning. Um, and how people had to agree or disagree with that on that scale. And what you notice there is that uh, the majority of those people are off to the left. That, the, that even in the sort of so-called tough guys in the insurance company uh, still have this belief, you've got to reduce the pain in order to get functioning. And that's probably where most of the community sits. And that is a worry, because if you're waiting for pain to go away when we don't have cures, you've got to wait a long time. Um, and that means, I think, we've got to start shifting community attitudes or beliefs about pain if we are to expect our patients to be able to function more despite their pain, because the people around them have trouble accepting or understanding this perspective. Um, and, of course, it's not just the community, it's also the healthcare providers. Um, they can be part of the problem. This was a, a study from Europe um, on physio physiotherapists there and their beliefs about back pain. Uh, and this, this study uh, identified two broad groups of physios, those who took what they called a very biomedical approach and those who took a more biopsychosocial approach to nonspecific back pain where there's no clear pathology. Um, those with the biomedical orientation viewed activities as very threatening, and they always advised their patients to be careful, let pain be their guide. The biopsychosocial uh, physiotherapists, on the other hand, took a completely different view and encouraged people to be functional despite pain, not to see it as a threat. But those with the biomedical one tended to see it as a threat <coughs> and promote activity avoidance. If they believe that, what's that going to do to the patients? They're clearly going to pick it up, and that, that actually is the evidence. That if uh, the therapist doesn't believe this approach, um, that will be transmitted to the patient. And uh, even if the approach has good evidence, the therapist won't institute it because they or won't institute it effectively because they don't believe it themselves. So the therapist um, can be part of the problem and need to be addressed as well. <coughs> it's the same in doctors. This is a uh, study in uh, spine. Uh, again, finding a lot of doctors had very idiosyncratic views about uh, uh, advice on active, being active when in chronic back pain. When the, all the guidelines say well, you've got to be active, but in fact, if you actually interview a lot of doctors, you'll find a lot of them are very restrictive, telling people not to do things rather than to do things. Um, so let's just update here. It's not just uh, the pain sufferer we need to talk about. We need to think about the healthcare providers and the general community. And everyone knows uh, and heard stories of people saying, you know, how can pain go on this long? They must be either malingering or imagining it or bunging it on or whatever. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of resistance to the idea in the community, particularly if you look all right. You, know, you don't have a walking stick or a neck brace or something or a bandage um, for people to understand that you can actually have pain and still be look, to look quite, quite well. Because you may, in fact, be quite well but you've got ongoing pain. Well, the good news here is that community beliefs can be changed. I mean, this is really why we have advertising, after all. Um, there was a great study done in Victoria a few years ago uh, by the Victorian um, uh, Work Cover Authority at the time. And this was a, 
uh, research by Rochelle uh, Bookbinder, who's a rheumatologist in Victoria, and she published this in the journal Spine and the BMJ. There were a series of articles. And what this involved was a, was a statewide education program in Victoria uh, where they had ads on TV uh, about being active despite your back pain. They had ads, little signs on the sides of motorways with the same message. And the, the message was, um, don't take back pain lying down. And that was the key message. Uh, it was run in the late 90s with those sort of ads. And it was evaluated by interviewing a random selection of the population before they started and then after uh, two and a half years. They also interviewed about 2,500 GPs. Um, and they compared Victoria to New South Wales. And what happened? Well, this is what happened. Uh, this is the beliefs about back pain. In New South Wales, you see over those years, the beliefs didn't change. Uh, in uh, Victoria, in, the, in uh, the beginning, the beliefs about back pain in the community were about the same as people in New South Wales. But those orange blocks at the bottom of the uh, right-hand picture indicate um, when the advertising was done. So as I've done in a block in 1998 and another block at the beginning, uh, at the end of 1999. Um, and look what happened to the uh, beliefs or attitudes towards back pain in Victoria. They changed... Uh, quite significantly. And even a couple of years after the advertising stopped, the, those beliefs were still a lot better than they were at the beginning, and certainly a lot better uh, than in New South Wales. When I say better, they were more accurate uh, about pain, and they recognised that you, it is important to be active when you've got back pain. Whereas in New South Wales, people still believe if you've got back pain, you've got to stop. You've got to be careful. You've got to avoid anything that aggravates it. So that's with beliefs, which can be changed clearly by advertising, which is, after all, why we pay so much for advertising, because it actually does work. Um, but then what about behaviour? Well, in Victoria, there was a decline in those years of claims for back pain at, from work injuries, the days off for back pain reduced, and the costs of medical management reduced. And as they reckon, they saved about $65 million over those years. In New South Wales, there was no change over the same period. In fact, probably things got worse. So what this indicates, the change in the community's beliefs uh, was quite effective, um, but also, importantly, it actually seems to have led to a change in the, the, their behaviour and the behaviour of their GPs. Because the GPs had all this information before that campaign. They had the same information, but it wasn't being implemented. But when the community came to agree on it, then the GPs and the patients got together and, and agreed. So I think that, that's a positive news story. So the truth about pain is, particularly when it becomes chronic, is that we cannot fix everything by ourselves. As health professionals, we have, we have severe limits on what we can achieve. But um, as in other chronic conditions, if we work cooperatively or collaboratively with the patient with this sort of problem, where they have to do a fair bit, they've got to do the exercises, they've got to set their own goals and work towards them, they've got to start cutting down on their, their medication, um, they've got to work on their communication skills, their anger management, and so on, then, um, and with the advice and support of their, their doctor or other healthcare provider, then we might start to get some progress. So Michael von Korf has written very nicely about this, this approach he calls collaborative care, uh, which seems much, much more appropriate for a chronic condition than you know, models of miracle cures and so on. Now, um, what can you do? Well, there are lots of things people uh, can do and do do. Uh, this is just a simple list we, we took from a survey that we, we did of people living in northern Sydney a few years ago. <clears throat> and these are the sort of things people say they do. I won't go through the whole list. I'm sure you're familiar with most of them. You'll see uh, various strategies of uh, hot and cold packs, tens machines, um, you know, various drugs, alcohol, marijuana, relaxation, prayer, um, and uh, you know, exercises, um, avoiding activities, hot showers, and so on. So there's quite a gamut of things people uh, have worked out for themselves or have been told about. Um, some of them have some evidence and others don't. But these are, if you took a general survey of the community, these are the sorts of things you'd hear about. Um, so um, if you think about it, come back to that diagram, how do they all fit into that big picture? This is really what you've got to think about. It's not just 
I'm doing this and this and that, but what's it for? <clears throat> Where does it fit into your management plan? So I think the answer here is not just about what technique you use, but what you're using it for. What's the purpose? Uh, if it's just about getting out of pain alone, that's unlikely to be sufficient. You need to think much more about, well, how can I also be functional? What can I be doing, not just getting out of pain? Um, so it's more than just a, a get out of pain sort of a ticket that, that you really need here. Um, and our survey we published in the journal Pain uh, was, again, a randomized selection of people from the community. We, 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 they were just rung out of the blue. They were selected at random. Um, and uh, what we found was a, a similar proportion of people with, with chronic pain to the one we found in the previous survey. And we also asked them in this survey, <coughs> what do you do to manage your pain? So that was why the title of the paper was Self-Management of Chronic Pain. And so these are people not coming to pain clinics, not, uh, but rather this was people in the community. We looked at, you can see that little box there, of the sort of things that people said they did. Um, and we, we divided these activities, as you can see there, into uh, active strategies, like active behavioral strategies, and cognitive strategies, uh, dealing with their thoughts, their, their mood state, and so on. And we compared those with people doing more passive strategies, like avoiding activity, resting a lot, and conventional medical, where things were done to them. So that's with physio devices or TENS machines applied or, or hands-on physio treatment and so on. Um, and the same with acupuncture and chiropractor, where passive means here having things done to you, active means you doing things yourself. Uh, now, I haven't got time to go through all the details, but what we looked at, well, what was the effect? And all the people we got all these strategies from, what was the effect of, these stra of using these strategies? Uh, and what we found, so you can see the results, is that those who use passive coping strategies uh, tended to be much more disabled than those who use active strategies, just putting it simply. Those who tried to do more for themselves, as described, tended to be more functional. Those who waited for others to fix them or relied upon others to do things for them tended to be more disabled. Um, it, what it means is that even though you might call a lot of those self-management methods, they're not all equally helpful. They need to be um, fairly ac active in nature. person in pain is playing an active role. Um, had less pain, were less disabled, were less depressed, were taking less medication, were catastrophizing less, and were much more confident. Um, and in another study we've just repeated, we found this sort of difference was repeated, and the, the difference between the groups was still the year, there one year later. So it does seem there are things we know that you can do that will help, and if you don't know them, you can be taught them. And that's what uh, the pain program uh, tries to do, but it can be done in a group or, or individually. Uh, but it does seem to influence their outcomes. So, in summary, regular use of these active self-management strategies does improve quality of life for people. If they haven't worked it out for themselves, many do, but if they haven't, they can be taught them. Um, now, of course, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I'm not saying everyone needs to do exactly the same. It depends on their needs and their issues, and that's why you can't just endorse one method or another. It's really about uh, for that person. But the, the, uh, I guess you could say this is about trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle despite pain, and what we've seen is it can be done, um, and, uh, but it would help if we have the support of the community and the healthcare community as well was uh, in agreement on, on this approach. And then I think as we saw in Victoria, we'd get an even better result than we can today. Well, that's about where I want to stop, uh, and I'm happy to look at some of your questions. I see there are quite a few questions, <laughs> um, and I'll uh, have a quick, uh, I'll go back to the beginning, I guess, to be fair. Um, 
And if I don't get through these, I will, uh, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll try to answer them online uh, via uh, Jen and Arthritis Victoria. Um, so um, some, of them, some of you are finding it a bit difficult, hopefully, but then it seemed to improve. Um, so that seemed to be all right. Uh, now, um, any questions there? So it would seem that those reduced activity would be an ideal time to provide intervention. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, um, uh, naturally, people, I guess, want to um, see if things work out for them uh, anyway and may delay. Um, I, th I think it, it, yes, it can be a core issue. Um, in fact, I think you can, we, um, people might wait a few days. They tend to go to the GP first. Uh, some people go to their chemist first or, or second. Um, and the next group people consult usually are the physios and then sometimes the chiropractors as well. But that, um, um, that I think delays are, can, can, be a, uh, can be a problem uh, unless they get into sort of un unhealthy lifestyles um, and then it's harder to change. Um, so I think encouraging people uh, either through public education as they did in Victoria or through education via the physios and the, uh, the GPs and the chemists would probably be a, a good place to start. Um, can you get a copy of the diagram? Yes, the answer is that. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, the, um, our only health practitioners with special knowledge and our place uh, suitable to advise. No, no, I've tried to make clear now, since uh, that I've finished the talk, hopefully you can see, <clears throat> and uh, is that I think that the, um, we, we, uh, uh, doctors need better education about uh, managing chronic pain, and, and many are taking up that challenge. Uh, we run a number of postgraduate courses or just for that reason uh, in our centre here, but uh, it doesn't have to be just be a multidisciplinary centre. I think that I think all health providers can do this, but I think also the general community can play a role too in encouraging people with pain and showing them understanding and acceptance uh, and encouragement to give things a go. Um, not just go and see the the latest fad therapist down the road. I think it's uh, I think encouraging anyone we know with chronic pain to to uh, to take an active approach. Um, so some people are still having trouble with um, noise. Uh, and then another is that I have great difficulty in reality managing to help people sleep better. <coughs> um, ah, yes, they always say, um, <laughs> people often say uh, they've tried something and it hasn't worked. Um, <coughs> I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's unwise to... Um, uh, you can always get into a, a dead end with that approach. So what we tend to find is that um, an easier way to proceed would be get people to start off with a pain diary to keep a record of their sleep habits, how, they sleep, how long they sleep and how many times they wake up and whether they, what they do before they go to bed and what they do when they wake in the night uh, and so on for a few days and then bring that little diary or record back and look at it with you. And this is where you're starting to collaborate with the person rather than having the miracle cure at your fingertips, which we don't. Um, it's starting to see what, what is the problem here. Is it getting to sleep or is it waking up through the night or is it what they do before they go to bed? Um, there are many things they need to do. Um, but if they start taking responsibility by uh, keeping a diary, then you're halfway there. Uh, they can then see, uh, uh, and usually what you see is things come to life. Um, and that will then guide what you do, rather than a one size for everybody. Um, so that's a way of getting around <coughs> this thing of people saying they've tried things. Um, uh, oh, you can't, okay, I'm trying, I'll, just, I'll read out the question first. Well, I think I tried to do that then. Um, do you run any pain programs? <coughs> uh, yes, yes, at our centre here at North North Shore Hospital in Sydney, we run, uh, we probably run more pain programs than any other clinic in Australia. We run both intensive three-week programs, but also briefer programs and individual programs. Um, and we've been doing this here since 1994. So we, we run a lot of these programs. Um, that, and we've helped others to set up their programs as well. And, that, and that's, um, that's um, we're only too happy to try to help do, do that. Um, what's next? Um, 
do I think chronic pain will be a bigger issue with increasing rates of obesity? <laughs> oh, that is yes, isn't it? Because that's going to put more, more pressure on joints. And uh, if that's the case, uh, I think that uh, they'll interact. And, of course, the trouble is um, that will lead to more, uh, more problems um, vice versa, because with pain, people want to be less active, and that will add uh, to their weight and, and so on. So it's quite easy to see that. Um, I'm trying to read out those. So what are your thoughts about our oh, group versus individual? Um, well, <clears throat> the advantage of individual is you can tailor it very closely to the person and you can fit in with their times. Like some people can only come at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and other people at other, some other time. Whereas a group, you've got to fit in with the group. Um, however, I think often the group is, uh, has advantages. Uh, I think it, in general it's more powerful. Uh, that's what we've found is that the, the group effect, the camaraderie, uh, people coming together and seeing they're not alone um, and getting support from each other and encouragement, it makes it a lot more fun than working individually. So I, I think, in fact, we find that the group program produces um, bigger effects uh, quite quickly, but it takes a lot more organising and it's less convenient. So you've got to weigh that up. And it depends on your resources too. Um, groups take more resources, um, so they're not, for, not able to be run everywhere. But if you can run them, I, I think there are advantages. But even outside groups, we still see people individually because the group can't deal with everything uh, in, a, in, a, in three weeks, say. So if they're more depressed or they've got PTSD, then that needs, they need to be addressed as, as well. Um, okay, what am I... So what is the cost? Uh, <clears throat> oh, there are programs, I believe, in Brisbane. I did a web search the other day to see what was around, and there were people advertising programs in Brisbane um, so I just look on the web. Must, uh, uh, I'd recommend you do that as well. Um, the cost of our program here at Royal North Shore is for compensable patients. That's under an insurance company. It costs just on eight thousand dollars for the three weeks, um, and that's just on 120 hours in total. We, we give them and with follow-ups, um, and so that's about just over about seventy dollars an hour, which is actually quite a reasonable price for what they get. Um, but um, Obviously, there are other prices people could pay for uh, this, but for public patients, people uh, who are public who are under Medicare, that's free. It doesn't cost them anything. Um, if uh, then, what else do we got? Uh, what about people who take pride in how bad their pain is? Um, well, I guess that's their thing, and uh, that's fine. Um, they're obviously not seeking help from people like us, <laughs> so uh, we, we would. I guess um, encourage them to um, um, keep going. And if, but if they want to change their minds, they want to come back and talk about it. They want to make some changes. Then, then we could talk. And then, do we? Uh, you'll get a copy of the presentation. Uh, I think so. Um, when do you say the three-week intensive program? How many times do they attend? Um, they attend every day, uh, nine to five, Monday to Friday. So it's about a you know sort of uh, well these days a 38-hour week that they come to our, our program is run. Other, other programs are, are briefer, uh, but that's what we do. Um, uh, in our practice, are we getting a better than 30% improvement? Oh yes, many people get a, lot, a much higher improvement than that. Um, it comes down to how much they do the strategies. As I said before, those who actually do the things we, we discuss, do the, apply the self-management, do get big changes in their lives. But those who don't, well, of course, they don't get much change at all. Um, so it, it's, it's not about the average, because the, the, the people who don't do it will always drag down the average. It's the people who do these things, they will do better. And, um, and you can just get the same results from the community survey, that those who use these strategies do better. Um, so it's not about having pain. It's also what you do about it. Um, um, in, actually, Michael, in the interest of time, I, I think we'd better... We better finish there, and I'm 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 very aware of sticking to time. Um, could I thank yeah. you very much, Michael, for your presentation today? It was really fascinating to just realise the the broad sort of multifactorial um, issues involved with pain management and self management and so on. I'd like to thank all our attendees as well. Um, there is one extra question there, which um, Michael will uh, address um, offline by email. Um, thank you again, Michael, and thank you, everyone. Could I please remind you, if you had just to take a few moments to actually um, fill in our evaluation, we would be most grateful. 
So thanks very much, Michael, and, um, and well done to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.